Welcome everybody to Metal Larkers 59. Amino Hassan is not with us today, clearly more important things to do. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, we have Kate Fagan, we have me, Howard Bryant, and we also have a special guest, Brian Howell of the Boulder Daily Camera. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Oh, I love having you here. Um, uh, first things first, congratulations to France. That's and, right. Uh, we've got a we've got a blockbuster finale with we do. Uh, we do. Argentina and France in Sunday's final, or is it Saturday? Mbappe. Sunday's final. Sunday morning. Sunday morning, That's early, right. ten a.m. Eastern. Messi, Mbappe, and uh, and a, a a shout out and farewell to our friend Grant Wall. Yep. Um, we are going to talk Deion Sanders, but before we do that, we are going to throw our our honorary captains. <laughs> for Meadow Lark is 59. I would suggest uh, 59s. Let's go with an obscure New England Patriot who had one of the great nicknames, Vic, uh, Vincent the Undertaker Brown. We could go with uh, we could go with Baltimore Ravens Roosevelt Colvin, uh, Super Bowl champion linebacker Darren Smith. It's all it's a linebacker edition. Um, since I'm in Philadelphia, we got to go with the fearsome. Uh, Buddy Ryan era linebacker Seth Joyner, and I can Ooh. only I can only think of one fifty nine in baseball, and that would be the phenom turned bust from the Oakland A's and the Texas Rangers, Todd Van Poppel. Brian, if you've got a fifty nine, <laughs> yeah, you got I, any, Brian? I do. You know, I, you know, I, you I'm Googling going to you admit got... I did I did Google, but I got a <laughs> Hall of Famer for you. Woo. All the famer from the Pittsburgh. Oh wait, Steelers. Jack Ham, Jack Ham, Jack, Jack Ham. Ham. I forgot all about Jack go. Ham. I yeah. Jack Let's Ham was do the Jack first Ham one. Then. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's got to be Jack Ham because last week we had fifty eight. We had Jack Lambert. So we and we said last week fifty nine. It's going to be Jack Ham, and here I am forgetting him. But thank you for picking <laughs> us up. Uh, we are really thankful for Brian to for uh, for joining us because you're very busy these days. You've got a new uh, you've, you've got a new resident in town. <laughs> Uh, tell us a little bit about the arrival of Coach Prime, the story of Coach Prime. How long was this in the mix? Um, do you actually have to call him Coach and Prime together? Can you just call him Dion, which is what I would do? Um, how's it been so far? Well, I haven't had a whole lot of interaction with him yet. Um, I am nervous about calling him Dion and getting in trouble for it uh, <laughs> because I, I've always called coaches by their first name. And, Same. You know, um, whether it was Carl Durrell, Mike McIntyre, um, you know, Kate Fagan, you know, Seal Berry, things like that. I, you know, I've always called them by their first name. And uh, so, but there's that famous video out there where Dion got upset with the reporter calling him Dion and then, and kind of, you know, walked off the zoom uh, and finished it. And um, apparently goes by coach prime. I have not done that yet. I haven't had a whole lot of interaction. I'm worried about calling him Dion, but uh, you know, I, I can, I can go with coach. I can't. Yeah, I don't know. That seems like too deferential sometimes, right? I yeah. only use coach when I've just completely blanked on the person's name. This is like, you know, obviously not if you're working their beat, you don't forget their name. But like, if you're doing a random interview, and I'm like, uh, coach, but otherwise, don't you feel like it's a little too, like bowing to it's them? It's a little too chummy. Yeah, it's a little too familiar. And it's also completely inaccurate, because you're not my coach. Correct. I That's cover you. That's where I sort of, and I do it. I, you know, I do find myself sometimes calling them coach, uh, but they're not my coach. And, um, you know, to me, you talk about bowing, you know, to somebody that's where coach prime to me sounds like bowing to it. Like hey, totally. coach prime, you know, because his name is not prime. Your name is not <laughs> you know, that, prime. That's a nickname he gave himself years ago. And so uh, I don't know if I'm too comfortable calling him coach prime. I have avoided for the most part, calling him coach prime in my writing. Um, although a lot of people do that. Um, you know, there's sometimes that it warrants it like the introductory press conference or the introductory story was, you know, it's obviously, you know, it's prime time in Boulder and, you know, coach prime. So you mentioned it in that regard, but um, in typical stories where I'm writing about the staff, I don't call him, you know, coach prime staff. I call it Deion Sanders staff. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and I think that's appropriate. And I think that that's, to me, I think it's a bullying, a bit of intimidation on, on, on Dion's part. Um, I've been covering for many, many years now. I know that there were guys when I was covering the Washington football team and their former nickname back in 05, 06, 07, uh, who called, who called Joe Gibbs coach. I always called him Joe. 
Um, and that's just how it is. And it's not, you know, it wasn't disrespecting him. That's what his name is. And that's what I called him. And I think that um, my suggestion, <laughs> not that you asked my suggestions. <laughs> I didn't ask you what you think. Um, I would say to him ahead of time, hey, man, I'm not trying to show you up because that's a lot of times what these guys think it is. Ahead of time, I'm not trying to show you up. That's just what I call coaches. I call them by their first names. I don't want to make a scene. Just let them know ahead of time. And then do your business. Stand your ground, man. That's you know? right, Brian. Stand yeah. your ground. <laughs> um, I like that. It probably is important at some point if I have that opportunity to chat with him. I mean, it's going yeah. to be very different covering this guy uh, in that, you know, he's got those team, that team of people around him that, you know, I don't know how close you can get to him. I mean, we had a an off the record lunch with him. You know, he had lunch with some of the media guys last Friday, um, you know, where we had to like, we actually had to um, put our cell phones in a basket when we got into the room and they took the basket out of the room. <laughs> you know, I guess they were worried about people recording things. And it was an off the record thing, although his people were, were videotaping the entire thing, um, you know, because that's what he does. They do documentaries. But um, the point is like, there wasn't a whole lot of interaction with him, like one-on-one. -on -one, it was, I shook his hand at the end and, you know, uh, I'm actually going to Atlanta this weekend to cover his last game with Jackson State. And I told him that. I said, hey, I'll see you down in Atlanta. He said, oh, that sounds good. And then that was about yeah. it. And so there wasn't a whole lot of interaction yet. I don't know how much interaction there's going to be with this guy just because this is a this is a celebrity, right? This is not just a normal coach coming in uh, to, to coach the University of Colorado. This is an actual celebrity that uh, has taken over the University of Colorado. Yeah, yeah. let's move over, Kate, to um, to the university itself. Yeah. Um, you are an alumni or an alumnus. Right. What, what is it called now? You're not in a, is it alumni or alumni just a, a -E. A -E, yeah. yes. <laughs> That's what uh, I'm going for. <laughs> and, a, and a former athlete there. What's the, what were your thoughts when you'd heard this was in the works? I'm, you know, as, as Brian just mentioned, this isn't a school where you're Brian over the history of you covering this school. This isn't a place where like the head coach you've had to deal with like, Huge, I'm not saying they didn't have egos because all football coaches do, but nothing like the celebrity status orbit that Dion brings into this. And truthfully, when I first heard this, when I first heard it, I thought there's no chance this is happening for reasons, you know, we'll hopefully we'll, we'll get into. But then the second my second thought was, but if it did, Colorado could finally be back because I don't, when I graduated in, in 03, that was probably the last time they, I know they had like a little bit of a run four, five or six years ago where they, where they started strong yeah. um, and were kind of in the hunt at the end of the year. But like, you're, you got to go back to Gary Barnett days when they, you know, made the Fiesta Bowl with like Bobby Pesavento and, and um, when Joey Harrington was the coach, uh, was the QB at Oregon. I'm just flexing the limited college football knowledge that I have, by the way, from 2003. <laughs> um, but, but when I heard Deion Sanders was taking over, I thought this honestly might be the only way Colorado can truly get themselves back because, you know, and, and here I want to like leave the floor for you, Brian, like Boulder's not necessarily a college football town in the way that other places are, they don't have the money that other places have also something we should get into. So I was kind of like, this might be the only way to get themselves back into this thing. Oh. Um, but, but to, sorry, Howard, go ahead. I was going to say, and, and, and Brian, the, the lead up to, to Dion coach prime taking this job had been that this was a bad job, that people didn't think he was going to take it, that this, that he was going to, as the celebrity coach, he could hold out and wait for something better, whether, you know, his dream job at Florida State or whether he was going to wait for Auburn and try to wait for Central Florida or wherever, that this wasn't going to be the gig anyway. What's he walking into and, and, and what were your thoughts off what Kate said? Well, and, you know, to Kate's point, you know, yes, it's a bad job when you take it over, but there's nobody like Dion that could quickly make it a good job. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's, you know, kind of Kate's point there is that there's a, there are other coaches that could have come in and, you know, I was from day one, I was I was uh, wanting Bronco Mendenhall. I thought he would be a good choice here, uh, the former BYU and Virginia coach. I still think, you know, we'll never see it, but I still think he could have come in here and in two, three years built this up to where they're going to bowl games and they're, and they're competitive and they're doing some good things. Nobody was going to change it quite like this. And, you know, Deion Sanders is the only candidate out there that possibly could have taken the worst Power 5 team, what, what they were this year, 
and all of a sudden made them the talk of college football and turned this into a pretty good job because all of a sudden he has the ability to get four and five star kids to come here. He's already flipped a, a running back that was committed to Notre Dame that's now coming here. Uh, I mean, Travis Hunter, who famously went to Jackson State last year instead of Florida State, the number one recruit in the country. Uh, sounds like he might come to Colorado now. Um, his son is a finalist for uh, the Walter Payton Award, which is the, basically the FCS Heisman, and he's coming to Colorado. Uh, so there's all these guys that are coming to Colorado that there's no coach that could have done that quickly like Deion Sanders. So uh, what he's walking into is basically a situation where he's told, hey, we are really bad. Dion, you just do whatever you need to do. <laughs> you know, this is your this is your show. Do what you need to do to get us back. And you know, Dion, I think is going to have pretty much free reign to do what he needs to to build the roster and get it to where he needs to. Okay, let's just let's just dive right in because Brian, to your point, Colorado's not. There's a lot there. I mean, there's there's there there. Right? There's the history, pedigree. There's a beautiful location. You're 25 minutes from Denver. I'm not telling you these things. I'm telling the listener. Like, there's. It's a beautiful campus. There's, it's, a, it's a good place to recruit to, except, and this is the premise of the 30 for 30 doc about those teams in the 90s, is it's one of the whiter places to recruit to. And no matter what coach you got in there, maybe with the exception of Deion Sanders, it was going to be difficult to recruit into Boulder, Colorado, because the University of Colorado itself, like the... People who go there, I mean, I forget, when I was there, it was something like 97% white student population on that campus. So, like, one of the big things that I think Dion brings to this program is, like, it's it, in one move, you're, like, clearing one of the biggest hurdles that Colorado football has, which is one reason why I thought coming off of Jackson State, it was going to be a tough job for him to take to go from an HBCU to one of the whitest schools in the power five yeah uh, what i will say to that is that at least what dion's going to touch is football and 70 percent of that to his point is not white you know um you know most of the roster is going to be black players and that's who he's going to touch mostly and i will say that there are a lot in history throughout Colorado history, and you know, you've probably seen this, Kate, but um, there are a lot of uh, players, you know, black players that have come to Colorado, even though it's traditionally white, they actually love it here and they stay here, you know, uh, whether it's you know, Colorado or Boulder. Like Darian Hagan is uh, maybe is arguably, you know, I will not say the best because probably Byron Wizard White's the best, but he was in the 30s. But <laughs> for those of us alive, Darian Hagan might be the most uh, recognizable name in Colorado football. And uh, that guy – Cordell Stewart? Cordell Stewart's up there, but I mean, Hagen led him to the national title, yeah. you know, and so, you know, there's, there's something there with, I mean, people love Darian Hagen and, but he came from South central LA, you know, and there was the whole thing in that 30 for 30 where, um, you know, it was, it was famously in that 30 for 30, how uh, Bill McCartney told Hagen's mother, like, look, you really want him to go to Nebraska and he comes back to this neighborhood wearing red <laughs> and Darian's like, all right, I'm going to Boulder, you know, um, <laughs> but Darian is, Still is still at the University of Colorado, loves Boulder and, uh, you know, has really taken to Boulder. It's been his his second home. He really, you know, with a couple of, of exceptions when he played a little bit in the CFL, he's lived in either South Central L.A. or Boulder, Colorado, and he, and he loves it. And so, um, yes, it is uh, predominantly white, but um, I think over the years, uh, especially in recent years, it's definitely um, a better and safer place than for the minority athlete than it was back in the 1990s. Well, and also there's a couple of other things at work here too when you're looking at college uh, sports. Number one, it's a little reminiscent when you were talking, Kate, of of Reggie White going to Green Bay, that you've got somebody now who can make an uncool place cool. That might do it. On the other hand, I think obviously when you're looking at college football, the most important thing is can you implement a system that is going to produce uh, pro players? where pro players are like, I want to play in the pros and that's the place where I need to play in order to get to the pros. Yeah, for sure. And so, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. bottom line is, I mean, kids are going to come here to play for Deion Sanders right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, and, exactly. and that's the poll. And on top of that, um, on that, let's ask a question that I don't think anyone has really ever asked, at least, at least in a, in a consistent way or, 
in a way that we've actually really discussed. Can Deion Sanders coach? What is his coaching philosophy? What what kind of offense does he run? What kind of defense does he run? What is if if how do we know what a Deion Sanders player is? Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. And that's a question that I have because his experience at this point is at the high school level and then Jackson State, which um, you know, it's the bottom line is the SWAC is not among the best uh, conferences in, in the FCS, and there's a reason why the SWAC uh, years ago decided not to send its uh, conference champion uh, to the FCS playoffs because uh, they weren't competing very well. And so it's a little bit easier, I think, sometimes to, to bring in 10, 12 really good players, and then you're pretty good at Jackson State. Uh, all that said, though, everything I've heard about Dion is he's actually you know a, a pretty good X's and O's guy and has really good football IQ. I mean, Rick George mentioned that uh, when, when he interviewed candidates, there was nobody more detailed and prepared than Deion Sanders. Like he had a, actually had a book uh, that he brought in on what he wanted to do for his plan. Um, I've heard that his football acumen is, is super high. Um, we actually, when we talked to him last Friday, he mentioned how when he was a player, uh, he used to coach players. You know, he, yeah. younger mm-hmm. players would, you know, would do something. He would pull them aside. And he, he said to us, look, you don't get a whole lot of coaching in the NFL because they expect you to be good. He would pull players aside and coach them. And so, um, I, I think this is going to test him, but uh, I'm not going to say he can't coach. I think that uh, this is just going to be a very different test for him. Yeah, and nor was I asked, nor was I saying that he can't. I was actually right. asking the question. I don't know what his I don't philosophy either. <laughs> is. And uh, and there's no question about Dion's IQ. Dion's a genius when it comes to what he did back there. Anyone who's ever seen him play knows that he wasn't just an athlete out there playing. He knows football. I mean, he not only does he know football, but he knows football so well that – he rejected baseball, right? He actually had a choice in terms of what he was going to do. People forget Deion Sanders was a spectacular baseball player. And if he had stuck with that, he could have been an outstanding baseball player as well. The The other question, Brian, worth asking as well to me, and then Kate, jump in wherever you want to go, is uh, I remember talking to Bomani about this a few uh, days ago, and we were talking about something that Deion Sanders hasn't really done a lot of probably since he was with the Falcons and that's lose. Um, he's not going 13 and 0 next year and he's not going 27 and five in his first three seasons. And, and, and if he does, that'll be, that'll be news. We'll be back here talking about this. Um, what's your feeling about what he's walking into in terms of a, a PAC 12 that is also under, you know, in serious transition as well with UCLA and USC and, and all kinds of things happening there. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. I think that's one of my main questions is how would he handle it if they don't win? You know, when you look at the schedule next year, uh, they start off, they go to TCU, which uh, is going to be coming off of a <laughs> college football playoff appearance, uh, perhaps a national title. Um, I don't think so, but perhaps um, they're in the running for it. Um, that's their first game. You know, the second game, they have Nebraska at home with Matt rule as a new head coach. I imagine they're going to be better. It's in Boulder, but you know, that's Nebraska. And then third game is Colorado state in Boulder. So you have, you go to TCU and then you have your two biggest rivals at home. What happens if you're zero and two or one and two to start, you know, how does Dion handle that? And then you get in the, in the pac 12 and they don't have the schedule out yet, but you're going to face USC with the reigning Heisman trophy winner. At some point, you're going to face UCLA. You're going to face Oregon, which is, always very good. You're going to face Washington, which Michael Penix Jr. has said he's coming back. So the nation's leading passer is coming back. You're going to face Utah, which is always very good. And so, yeah, they're not going 13-0. Uh, they may not win eight games, seven games. Does he win six? I don't know. Um, I'd be very curious to see what happens if if they are a losing team next year. Brian, let's go back to something um, you said a couple minutes ago about Rick George, Colorado AD, interviewing Dion and, and Dion coming so prepared to the to the interview. And he and, and Rick interviewing other people as well. What how, my, I guess this is a broad question. How do we get here? Right. Like, how do we get to a place where Colorado is able to offer Dion six million dollars? Other candidates they're offering, I'm assuming they weren't going to pull out and write a check for six million dollars a year for some other candidates. And if you look at the history of Colorado and the coaches that they they've never done anything like this. So how did we get here? Well, I, I think, you know, and I'll go back to what you, know, you guys were saying initially. I think it was Kate saying this, but um, when, when Dion's name was initially brought up, 
I was like, there's no way he's coming here. I mean, there's not a shot. The answer, why would he come to the worst power five team in the country? And he's going to, and this was at the time that remember he's on 60 minutes and college game day is going down there. And my thought was that guy's going to have a handful of power five offers. There's no way he's taking this one. Well, it doesn't appear he had a whole lot of power five offers. Um, We haven't heard of one other one uh, that actually offered him. And so um, this may have been his best shot. So first off, I always said the only way he comes to Colorado is that this is his only power five shot. It may have been, but how did Colorado get here? Um, Kate, I think that uh, part of it is you're right. I don't think anybody else would have gotten 5.5 million year one right off the bat, an average of 5.9 over five years. Carl Durrell was the highest paid coach in CU history, got 3.6 this year. Um, I think other candidates probably would have been offered around four, but with Dion, uh, I think the reason why we got here is, um, for lack of a better term, a little bit of desperation. You know, this team is 1-11. and They're the worst program in the country. Um, you have national people saying that this is the, probably the worst Power 5 roster in the country. Uh, you have people that uh, were – I mean, the, the, the stands were empty most of the second half. They're getting blown out every week. And you needed somebody to bring juice to this program. And I think that that's what CU is gambling on. And and it, it's already paying off. I mean – just to give you a couple of numbers real quick, I talked to their ticket guy yesterday. They're in the, the current stage of uh, season ticket renewal, so they're not selling new, new tickets right now. But 25% of season ticket holders have renewed since Dion was announced. And uh, they've got 7,000 applications for new season tickets. And I asked the guy, well, how's that compared in the past? He said, over the entire offseason, we used to maybe get a few hundred, maybe topping out at 1,000. They've got 7,000 applications and 1,700 deposits on season tickets in the first uh, seven, eight days since Dion was announced. Uh, so that's that's why CU is at this point. <laughs> they need this guy to do things like that. Uh, merchandise sales. Um, last last week, the men's team played uh, CSU in basketball, and Dion Sanders walks in with 15 minutes left in the game, and the place went absolutely nuts. Uh, they chanted Dion Sanders' name for you know a minute. They're going nuts, and I mean it was. It was the the loudest cheer of the night, and they beat CSU by 28 points or whatever it was. So uh, it was a really good basketball game, and the loudest cheer was for Deion Sanders. That's why we're here. And, and Brian, when you know you mentioned that like a typical offseason might be a couple hundred, back to my like original statement, which you know I haven't lived in Boulder in 20 years, and so so maybe I'm some of my philosophies about why the CU program is considered the worst in the Power Five. They could be flawed. What how did Colorado, coming from such pedigree, what is it about Boulder? Why did the Colorado program find itself in that place of being one in whatever, you know, 11 um, and, and the worst team in the Power Five? How do we get here? Yeah, I think there's sort of two answers to that. And, you know, there's the long term answer that, uh, you know, once they fired Gary Barnett in 2005, you know, they they stacked that up with. Dan Hawkins didn't work out. Then John Emery didn't work out. And then Mike McIntyre kind of got things going a little bit. But so there's that long-term answer that they haven't had great hires. But I go even shorter term than that in that they were actually on their way back a little bit just a couple of years ago. And Mike McIntyre did a really good job in 2016, which you referenced. Uh, they were 10-4. and four. They won the Pac-12 South. And, you know, he kind of built that team up. And then two years later, after a couple of five and sevens, they, they fire him and they want to move on to – take the next level, but they were a very competitive five and seven. I mean, 2018, they were five and zero and ranked in the top 20 in the country and then lose their last seven games and fire Mike McIntyre. So they bring in Mel Tucker, uh, who, you know, brought in some juice. I mean, he, he was a really good hire at the time, but 15 months later, the guy leaves. And a month after that, or you hire Carl Durrell, but then a month after that, the pandemic hits <laughs> and all of a sudden the world of college football has changed so much since Carl or since uh, Mel Tucker left this program because NIL's become a thing, the transfer portal's become a thing. All those guys that were recruited by Mel Tucker w- left. You know, they, they played that first year because they really couldn't go anywhere because of the pandemic, but then left last year. You know, we're talking Brendan Rice that's now playing at USC. You know, Christian Gonzalez, who just declared for the draft out of Oregon, was CU's best corner the last two years. So they had some really good talent that, that brought in, but they were just sick of the change. And all of a sudden, you had a depleted roster this year that six of your best players from last year were playing for other programs. One of them is playing in the college football playoff with TCU this year, or this week, mm-hmm. or this month, whatever it is. Um, so you, 
I think it's happened very quickly and that CU did not adapt to that transfer portal, NIL space, and then all the coaching change in a short period of time leads to players who are like, I'm out of here. I'm tired of this, cha- of all these changes, and I need, I need to pick my own coach. Yeah, well, the most amazing thing to me so far is that Colorado lost 11 games last year, and in those 11 games, the lowest number of points they gave up was against TC. It was 38. But – the one game they won, they only gave up 13 points to Cal. What was happening that day? <laughs> well, that was the perfect storm of everything <laughs> uh, in that they had fired Carl Durrell um, after the previous game and then had a bye week. And so they have the new staff. Cal's not a very good football team, but um, they're okay. They're coming into Boulder. And you think about this, if you're Cal, you know, you're, you're, you're not a great team anyway, but you're coming into Boulder with – you have no idea what the new offensive coordinator – and new defensive coordinator are going to do because uh, they didn't only fire Carl Durrell, they fired the defensive coordinator. So Colorado's got new schemes that Cal had no film on. And mm-hmm. so CU was able to kind of take all of that. It was family weekend. So the, the stadium was packed and it was just this perfect storm of everything hitting at once that I think the element of surprise played a role. CU was fired up and they were able to get that win in overtime. And um, that only lasts one game because then everybody sees the film. And they're like, oh, yeah, we see what they're doing. Let's go. Let's go beat up on the bus now. Yeah. Your last four games, 49 to 10, 55, 17, 54, 7 and 63 to 21. So Deion Sanders is going to have to work on the team's defense. Yeah. Um, so the other the thing that I, I wanted to bring up on this um, too, when it comes to all of these things that you're that you're up against, uh, you're talking about the instability. I wonder what that means for him in terms of all of the movement that you have. Does he look at this and go, mm, "I'm out of here"? Like, does is there? Wh- what sense are you getting? Obviously, it's honeymoon stage right now. Nothing has even started yet. But what sense are you getting for the appetite of of that transition? Or does does he feel that I'm here to win and I think we can win immediately and I've got a surprise for everybody? Yeah. Not knowing him very well, it's hard for me to answer that and to know exactly what his thought process is for staying here for very long. Um, my perception of him and just the whole situation is that um, he's got two sons that are, well, at least one that's going to come with him. There's um, one of them. He keeps saying, Oh, he's in the doghouse. I don't know if he's coming, but either way, um, his son who he announced at the press conference is going to be the starting quarterback, which might be a little bit of an NCAA violation because you know, the kid's still at Jackson state and not in a portal, but (laughs) anyway, um, his son is a sophomore. She's got two years of college left. I'm very curious how long do, or does Dion stay here when his sons aren't, aren't here anymore? Because Dion's coaching history is he went to Jackson State at the time that his sons were going to Jackson State. And before that, he coached his sons in high school. So uh, does Dion stick around and coach the University of Colorado after his sons are graduated? I don't know. And, you know, it, could he also be the type that, you know, he goes seven and five next year and then they're 11 and one the year after that and he bolts for, you know, Nick Saban retires and, and he bolts for Alabama, you know, or someplace like that. I don't know. Um, I'm hesitant to think that he's going to be here very long. I'd be a little surprised if this is, if this goes beyond two, three years. But um, I think it's it's one of those things that Colorado needs to take that risk and, and just ride the wave as long as it's possible. Yeah, I mean, may, that you, maybe this makes this question obsolete if, if Dion isn't going to be there, you know, past two to three seasons. But everything I've read suggests that Rick George signed Deion Sanders promising money that Colorado just doesn't have yet. I mean, when I was there, Brian, Colorado had the minimum number of varsity sports to be able to be division one and still do and still do. I mean, this is not a school that is, has like rich coffers to make moves. I'm not saying they shouldn't have done this, but that's in that's a, that's quite a position to be in is to be committed to a contract that if for some reason you need to pay it out and things don't go well you're talking what 18 20 million that you do not have yet there's no question there other than like that's a, that's that's quite a position well and add in the fact that they they just fired Carl Durrell and got rid of all the assistants altogether 
they owe about eleven and a half million dollars to Carl Drell and his assistants. So it's not just the twenty nine and a half million coming to Dion. They've got to come up with eleven and a half million dollars. Now, if if any of those guys get jobs, that offsets that a little bit, but yeah. it's not going to offset it that much. And so you've got to come up with all that money. And you know, I, yeah, people have seen that comment from Rick George and they're like, whoa, that's <laughs> that's kind of interesting. And it is very interesting because uh, you don't hear that very often. But what Rick George is banking on is number one ticket sales and we like i said we've already seen it um they're going to this place is going to be sold out for nebraska probably csu and i wouldn't be surprised if most of the season is sold out uh because of the dion factor and so you're looking at several million dollars coming in because of that uh you know they're hoping and probably praying that uh the pac-12 uh, comes in with a really good media rights deal as they're negotiating right now uh that brings in more money and uh from what i've heard i think there's also I think there are donors out there that have money that have been reluctant to donate to CU because it hasn't been very good and that that might be more willing to donate when it's a Deion Sanders program and they see something that like, wow, we're committed. We could actually be a really good program here. So I think those three factors are playing into Rick George's mind of like, that's how we're going to get the money. Yeah. Isn't it also a, a, a sea change that we're in in college football right now anyway, because I think when we were talking about this, so much of this story has focused on Dion and the relationship to HBCUs and his responsibility or uh, unfair burden placed on him in terms of responsibility for overseeing um, a football program instead of having to be the savior for all the problems historically that HBCUs, HBCUs have had in terms of recruiting, finances, resources, all of that. Um, maybe this is what college football looks like now. Nobody's going to stay 20 years. And there was conversations about him. Well, you know, we thought he was going to be the next Eddie Robinson. Eddie Robinson wouldn't be Eddie Robinson in today's college football. Nobody's going to stay 30, 40 years at, at one place. And so maybe the, the two or three year expectation is appropriate anyway. Yeah, I think so. And it, it's just not, it's not feasible these days. I mean, there's a Kyle Whittingham that uh, is unique, you know, a Nick Saban, where's Nick going to go, right? <laughs> Nick has nowhere to go because there's no place above Alabama traditionally, um, you know, Dabo Swinney, you know, things like that. There's certain places that you've topped out. Uh, but for the most part, coaches, they come and go. I mean, look at Jimbo Fisher. You think he's in a really good spot at Florida State, and all of a sudden Texas A&M comes and offers him a lot of money, and he leaves. So um, this is just not a profession that you know you're going to be there for a long time. And I think it's it's going to be less common that you see guys there for seven, eight, ten years than it is two, three, four years. And so um, you know, I, I come at it from a different perspective. I've seen a lot of the criticism of Dion uh, for leaving, uh, but at the same time. You know, he wasn't going to be there for probably more than a couple more years anyway. And, you know, if I'm having questions about whether he stays at CU after his sons graduate, there's no way he's staying at Jackson State after his sons graduate, making 300000 You Now, he could stay at CU making $5.9 <laughs> million you know, without his sons, but that's different than making 300000 at Jackson State. So um, to me, from the outside looking at it, I think what he did uh, down at Jackson State for the HBCUs was great. Uh, and it's sort of like Colorado right now, you ride the wave as long as you have it. And you know, they rode the wave for three years and you hope that you can, uh, you know, capitalize on some of that. And the fact of the matter is those HBCUs have been on national TV um, even before him. I mean, you know, the, the, the Grambling Southern game has been on TV for years. The Celebration Bowl, which uh, Dion and his team is playing in this week, has been on uh, ABC mm -hmm. for, for years before Dion got there. And um, a lot of people don't know this. I actually saw an article that, uh, the incorrectly referenced, uh, you know, before Dion got there, Jackson State was playing in front of empty seats. No, Jackson State has led FCS in attendance four straight years, and that includes two years before uh, uh, Dion got there. And the SWAC leads all conferences. In, in you can go back, I went back 12 years. The SWAC's been the leading conference, uh, in the FCS for attendance for that entire time, so they get attendance there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, Brian, your beat just got way more exciting than it has probably been in a long time, judging by the fact yeah. that you're traveling down to Atlanta to catch Dion's yeah. last game. But from a broad perspective, you know, as an outsider looking in at college football, I just see chaos because I don't have my mind wrapped, wrapped around the transfer portal. I'm not checking it daily. 
I don't, I don't, I don't quite yet understand NIL in the way that you'd really need to, to be able to cover it on the inside. Is it as chaotic as it seems? Yes. Cause I, I can't keep up with it. I mean, it's, it's constant, like, especially right now with there's a transfer portal window that's 45 days. And so I'm constantly looking like, all right, are any buffs going in the transfer portal? And more so than that, uh, there hasn't been a ton, which has surprised me, but more so than that, it's seemingly every hour there's, oh, Deion Sanders and his staff have offered this five-star guy that's committed to Texas A&M, or they've offered this guy that, uh, you know, is now, he's currently committed to Notre Dame. And now he's coming on a visit to Colorado. So there's all this stuff. And then NIL, there's always new things coming up. And so, yeah, it's it's chaotic and it's hard to keep up with it. In this and new world, stuff, oh, go ahead, Kate. Sorry, and, and that stuff you're talking about, like Dion and his staff offering some five-star player who's already committed elsewhere. Did that used to be technically illegal or just like, a you know, just more like gentlemen's don't recruit over the top of somebody else's verbal agreement? Like, or has this always happened or now that you can – decommit, transfer portal, all of that, this stuff is sort of just free for all now? Yeah, well, I'm looking at this. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, Brian. I was going to say off of what Kate was saying. Even just the word offer feels really weird in college football or college yeah. sports period. What are you offering? Yeah. They're not supposed yeah. to be transfers of money well, here. As far as the you know the high school kids, this stuff has always happened, obviously, because yeah. it's recruiting. And you know, until the kid signs their, their name on the National Letter of Intent, they're not – you know, binding to that school. And so uh, what's new is that the University of Colorado head coach could go to a five-star kid that's committed elsewhere and make an offer and the kid actually considers yeah. it. That's what's yeah. new. And so yeah. um, it's not really, I mean, this stuff's happened for years. It's more so that, wow, Colorado. <laughs> I'm actually trying to picture like m some other previous Colorado coach calling up a five-star recruit who's committed to Texas and being yeah. like, I just want you to know we also offer you. Yeah. And the laughs that would result in that phone call, right? Yeah, and and they would have known that, and so they wouldn't have probably done it. And exactly. So, exactly. Uh, typically, what we see at Colorado is, um, I've seen this many times, is Colorado, you know, you know, with Carl Durrell, uh, with happened with Mike McIntyre sometimes, is that they would be one of the first teams to offer some kid, and you know, these kids throw out their offers on Twitter all the time, right? That oh, I'm so I'm so blessed to get an offer from the University of Colorado. And so you'd see a kid get an offer and he doesn't really have a rating yet. He doesn't have any other offers. And then two months later, all of a sudden he's a three star and he's got, you know, 12 power five offers and he's no longer committed to Colorado. He now decommits and now he's committed to Baylor. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden he decommits from Baylor and he's committed to Texas now because they came in with an offer. So that's typically what we've seen is Colorado gets in early on guys, but then, you know, you know, for the term that people like to use, the prettier girl comes along and says, no, I want to take you out. <laughs> and, the, and the guy says, yeah, I'm going to go with you instead. And so that's typically what's happened to Colorado, not them going and saying, hey, you're committed over here. someone else's, yeah. Yeah, we're going to take your kid now. And so that's what's new. And then you throw in the transfer portal thing where, you know, we're talking about, you, you know, kids that are at Alabama and things like that are considering, they're, they're jumping in the portal and considering, huh, I might go to Colorado. So yeah. that type of thing is and, new. And like, I mean, again, cause I am, I, I, I need to study this NIL stuff and how it's actually working on the ground, not just some, you know, some NCAA rule I can read. Is it, is it real that Dion could say to some quarterback, some five-star quarterback, come to Colorado. I guarantee you at least a multi-million dollar NIL deal. I will help put that in your pocket. I mean, these are the things that they can now do, yes? Well, legally, no. Right. Is it done? Probably. Um, yeah. But legally, the school and those associated with the school cannot um, help broker any of those NIL deals or, or get those done. But um, they can – they work around it. <laughs> you know, it, right. it, that type of stuff has always kind of happened. And so I'm sure it's happening and it's not going to be talked about, but um, it'll – I'm sure things like that are happening. So the answer to your question is yes, but not legally. <laughs> right, right, right. But that, but that type of thing is happening. I mean, I, I'll say this. Um, I chatted with a women's basketball coach. Um, th their team was in Boulder to play CU uh, earlier this season. Uh, this is a non-Power 5 school. And 
I, w- I happened to be there. It was the day before the game, and they showed up for practice, and I ended up chatting with his coach. And uh, I was chatting with him about his team a little bit, and we were just off the record talking. And, and I said, well, tell me about this girl here. She's averaging like 18 points a game, and she's a sophomore. And, and he said, yeah. And we were talking about her. He, he's, she's really good, all that. And, and he said, I don't know how long she's going to be here. And he was, he was telling me stories. This is a non-Power 5 school that, you know, some girl averaging 18 points a game. Um, her AAU coach will come to her and say, hey, would you be interested in going to, say, Florida? If, uh, if you jumped in the portal, um, what, what would you think about that? And so there's, like, back channels of, like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm throwing out teams that are – it's not real, right? right? But, like, right, Florida right, right. might come to the AAU coach of this girl and say, do you think if she jumped in the portal, she'd come to Florida? And <laughs> so then the AAU coach would go to her and say, um, would you be interested in that? And so yeah. th- that type of stuff was really happening, not with those schools, but uh, with this girl, that stuff is happening. And so um, – And the would finder's be, fees that come with it. Right. right, and this is this is women's basketball. Um, right, and so imagine you know, what's happening at Power Five college football, football Imagine what's happening at Power Five football. Yeah. right, and so yeah. especially with you know a quarterback or a star running back, things like that. I mean, I heard the story this last off season that uh, there was a running back that um, C was really in on uh, a transfer running back coming from another school that uh, they thought they were going to get, and then all of a sudden the call stopped, and they didn't hear from the guy at all. And come to find out, he went to a different school in the Pac-12. And uh, I don't know if this is true, but heard he was offered uh, six figures to go to that other school. And that's why he stopped calling Colorado. Yeah. So you can't you know, afford to take my calls. Right. You can't <laughs> afford it. So that type of stuff is happening all the time. And uh, I think it's going to be happening more so at Colorado than it has been. You, given all of this, like the chaos of all of what we've been talking about the last few minutes, do you have conversations and do you start thinking, Brian, and, and it's something we've talked in previous Metal Lockers mm-hmm. episodes here about like the future of college sports and particularly college football, because I mean, I live in Charleston, South Carolina. So I, I wanted to watch the world cup at a sports bar the other day and there was a Georgia football game on and they just wouldn't, they had 22 TVs and not one of them could be spared for the world <laughs> cup. Right. It was just all college football. How and even dare like, you. And how dare you ask to put football on? I mean, soccer. Um, and we're getting some work done in our house, and all the guys are huge college football fans, and we're talking about the NIL and the transfer portal. And even those guys are like, this isn't sustainable. Like, this is yeah. just pure chaos. So what are your thoughts on where college football goes from here? I wish I knew. I, I think – I wish they would regulate it somehow because I think it is chaos that um, – people have likened it to NFL free agency, but it's worse than that because NFL players can't just pick up and go wherever they want after every season. They're under contract and, you know, but, but college football players can now, I mean, you're looking at, uh, you know, guys like JT Daniels who um, started his career at USC uh, gets injured his second year uh, gets replaced by Keaton Slovis. Okay. So after that year, JT Daniels goes down to Georgia. Well, he doesn't win the starting job. So this last year he plays at West Virginia. He just entered, entered the transfer portal again. He's got one year left. He's going to be on his fourth school. Well, the guy who replaced him was Keaton Slovis, who then got hurt the next year, got replaced. He played a pit this year. Well, now Keaton Slovis is in the transfer portal again. So, you know, uh, these guys can just jump wherever they want to go. And, and the NCAA says the rule is you can transfer one time, you know, as an undergraduate without having to sit out. Well, they give waivers to everybody anyway, and so it doesn't really matter. So you're seeing guys that are – they can play for new teams every year. and They've got to do something to fix that because it's, it's hard to manage a roster. It's hard to build team camaraderie. Uh, the 2016 CU team that we've talked about a little bit was built. They went 10 and four because they had a group of seniors that came in together as freshmen and they got beat up as freshmen and sophomores. They got better as juniors. Then they were pretty good as seniors. That stuff's not going to happen anymore because guys will stick around long enough to get beat up. I mean, they want to move around and, and go play for other teams. So that's what's got to be regulated. Will it? I don't know. If it's not, I think it's just going to be this wild, wild west, uh, chaotic mess every every winter. Yeah. Well, it absolutely, Brian, sounds like you've got your hands full this year yeah, or next year. Right. We're looking forward to seeing all that happens, hoping you'll come back and join us. And also, you heard it here first, breaking news, Brian Howell is advocating for a reserve clause franchise tag in college football. <laughs> yeah, they got to do, <laughs> yeah. do something. They got to do something. I just wish, to me, 
as a, I love college football. Um, I've loved it my whole life and um, I'm somewhat of a purist and I get all the other parts of it, but uh, it saddens me to see that guys just uh, move around all over the place and that you know, it's just hard to watch sometimes when, you know, there's, I mean, you're seeing starting quarterbacks on pretty good teams that are entering the transfer portal. I mean, that's just insane to me that, you know, to me, it was, it was originally like, all right, you're going to see guys that don't play a whole lot that might want a better opportunity to play. But now it's guys that are established stars at their, at their schools and pretty good schools are moving on. So it's, it's crazy. Yeah. All no right. Question. All right. Well, Brian, thank you so much. We will see how things unfold in Boulder. Hope you'll, like I said, come join us again. Um, for Kate Fagan and the the where is he anyway the the missing Amin, Amin, Amin. Elhassan the too busy the too cool for school Amin Elhassan I'm Howard Bryant we will see you next week on Metal Arc is 60 and to uh to Kate Fagan's delight I am tanked and tapped on number 60. All right. Okay. I don't there are not many 60s we got out none. there. I don't have any either. That's perfect. Uh, 60. I'm thinking <laughs> the only guy I can think of right now is a uh, Washington football team center Chris Samuels was not even a center. He was a uh, he was a uh, right guard I think. Uh Chris Sam the left guard Chris Samuels um, and I got to think long and hard about number 60s but I'm I'm a little a tapped. I got a week <laughs> tapped on 60s. We will see you next week. Take it easy.